Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, and welcome, mayors. I, I'm really excited to be here to lead this discussion because I was born in the Midwest, in Emporia, Kansas, just about four hours south of here. And I've spent a lot of time in this uh, region with family. I'll be heading to Council Bluffs later today to see family. So I know that this is a, a complex picture, really. I mean, it's not all sunshine and roses, and it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, we have cities th that are struggling, but we have others like yours that are really thriving. So I'd like to start with our host, Mayor County. I think Des Moines is, is such a perfect example of this um, Last year, U.S. News and World Report named Des Moines the number one most affordable place to live in the entire country. Forbes uh, called you the top five, one of the top five best places for business and careers. I mean, your population is growing while major cities on both coasts are either stagnating or losing population. <clears throat> what is the secret? I mean, is it the affordability factor or, or is it, say, um, Iowa's low unemployment? I mean, just 2.9%. You know, I, I, I think it's all those things. But most importantly, at least for me, as I look out in this, this audience, and I think an awful lot of these people are from our metro area, and it's, it's, it's the citizens in our constituents working together with business and all of us planning together. It used to be sort of a separate thing uh, where the city would work with business and then they'd maybe work a little bit with neighborhoods. But we try to all plan together because this has to be a great place uh, not only for employers to want to locate a business and, and have a business, as uh, it was touted and you just noted, uh, but it also has to be a great place for people to live and want to, to locate here and then seek a job. So it's uh, working hand in hand and all of us being partners and not just uh, you know, the city of Des Moines, we work as a region. We started out with a tomorrow plan. Uh, we uh, uh, work together in so many different ways. What is we, the tomorrow plan? Well, tomorrow plan is a regional sustainability plan that we did through the regional, our, our metropolitan planning organization, which generally just does streets and highways and that sort of stuff. But uh, we thought, Maybe we ought to plan the area before we start laying the roads down. Good idea. And let's figure out how we get this done. And uh, I think uh, through that collaboration and through organizations, uh, you know, like Bravo and uh, um, like the CVB, we uh, uh, fund those. There's a there's I don't a, know what these there's are. There's a hotel motel okay. tax in the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, so uh, some people are really surprised to hear that two sevenths of a seven percent tax goes to the Convention Visitors Bureau to help attract uh, opportunities in, in, in industry to Des Moines. Uh, and Bravo is a culture and arts kind of a, of a thing. And two, two sevens goes to that. And people say, really? People are willing to pay that kind of a tax and put it over to that rather than to some of the other things. But I think it's the quality of life uh, that people look for as they're locating a business and as they're looking uh, individuals looking for a place to live. And I think Des Moines has, has done that. I mean, 20 years ago, we wish we were in the top 50 of some of those lists that you're talking about. And to be heralded as one of the number one places in the country for a wide variety of reasons. You left a few out, by the way. Um, <laughs> I know, well, I didn't have time. I mean, we have to let these gentlemen speak too, right? <laughs> but uh, it's just uh, unbelievable. I mean, uh, 15 years ago, we probably had 1,800 people living in downtown Des Moines. Today, we've got about 17,000 living wow. in downtown Des Moines with a, a daily employment of around 80,000 and uh, uh, some great restaurants and millennials and empty nesters all living and in, in looking for an opportunity to and find a place to live downtown where they can walk, they can take public transportation, they can find great uh, uh, places to eat. Uh, and I think some of those is the heart of Iowa in the heart of, of our metro area is very, very attractive uh, to an awful lot of people. You know, Mayor Pete, um, your city is a little bit smaller than, than Des Moines. Uh, you became mayor um, in 2012 at the age of 29, mm -hmm. correct? You the, the youngest mayor in the United States of a city of, of just over 100,000. Now, since then, <clears throat> South Bend's population has been on the upswing. I mean, there was a time, right, when we talk about lists, what it had been named by Newsweek as Dying city. A dying city, which is terrible. <clears throat> and now you have won awards and kudos for your leadership. You have said that uh, the size of your town, being small, 
kind of makes you more nimble. You're, it's easier to experiment. Talk to us about what you've done and, and what's been working. Yeah, we think we're in a real sweet spot. So, uh, and I think this is true of a lot of uh, cities in the Midwest, somewhere between you know 50 and let's say 400,000 in the metro area as a whole, that you're, you're big enough that you encounter complexity, that if you can solve a problem there, it matters. Uh, we're big enough that we at least taste every city opportunity and issue from public transit to gang violence. Uh, but you're also small, small enough that you can uh, be nimble, that you can work around these issues. Uh, and so uh, for us, we've, we've positioned ourselves as a beta city. In other words, if you have a new technology, a new policy idea, a new social innovation, we're the kind of place you would want to try that out. And it's worked tremendously to our benefit. Everything from my, only a mayor could love this boast, but we have the, the smartest wastewater system in the world, in my view. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Partly because we were the right place to deploy a technology using sensors that is now saving us hundreds of millions of dollars wow. on Clean Water Act compliance. And a little company sprouted up out of that that's a tech company creating jobs, selling the same technology to other cities around the world. Uh, many of you have seen dockless bike share systems like Lime Bike and their competitors. We were the first city in the country to do that at scale. Seattle eventually overtook us once there had been the kind of proof of concept at our scale. Because again, we were big enough that it mattered if it worked there but small enough that you could gather the community of interest around an issue quickly, get the attention of the mayor. Um, and that allows us, I think, to really live into that, that promise of our towns and our cities as the true laboratories of innovation for the country. You know, mayor Carter, St. Paul's once declining population is also <clears throat> on the rise. Um, I know you've been in office just what, seven months, yes. but you- um, So I'm I'd, responsible for the rise. Absolutely, <laughs> amazing, how did you do that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the Fortune 500 headquarters, you have yes. so many of those in your town, which of course you're responsible for as Absolutely. well, right? Uh, but what is your city's secret sauce, would you say? Oh, I'm, I, I think I would agree that we don't necessarily have time to talk about the, all the ingredients of our right. secret sauce. Uh, we're a city that boasts a really high quality of life. Uh, we right, have, a very, have a growing population. Uh, our population is uh, grown by 24,000 people over our 2010 census alone. Is it uh, young people coming in? Who's coming? It's, you know, we have people coming in from Asia and Africa. We have people coming back into cities all over the country from the suburbs. We have people coming to the city from all over the country. Uh, we have folks coming in for, for a number of different reasons. Uh, and one of the reasons is because we, like I said, have had such a high quality of life. Uh, we've got a strong school system. We've got uh, more river frontage than any city in America. And we're in the city of... Uh, the, the state of uh, 10,000 lakes. Uh, and so we just have a whole lot to boast in our Twin Cities metro area. We have had One challenges. of the happiest cities, right? In the One of the happiest yeah. cities. <laughs> we have had challenges, uh, and particularly regarding uh, our, uh, uh, our, our disparities. We have uh, large and growing communities of color. We have large and growing immigrant and refugee communities uh, and ensuring uh, that all of our communities uh, are able to tap into and take advantage of uh, and enjoy that prosperity that our greater city has offered. I mean, you're working is on one housing of our biggest lot, challenges. Correct. We're working on a, a number of things right now. Uh, I just proposed a $71 million uh, investment in affordable housing over the next three years. Uh, I just proposed doubling our uh, street reconstruction budget uh, from last year to uh, into the future. Uh, and providing our first uh, dedicated funding for bike lanes uh, and a number of other things that we're proposing right now. We just eliminated late fees in our library la a couple weeks ago, so we're really excited. As an author, that. I love that idea. Love that idea. You know, there's 51,000 <laughs> 51, library cards in St. Paul de Sorry. deactivated right now for late fees. Uh, average of $33 in late fees going back to 2009. It was a real hard decision until I realized we actually want kids to read. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Read books, <laughs> not just right. on tablet. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Mayor County, I want to go back to you because we are here um, in farm country. How does a city like Des Moines support both agribusiness and the family farm? Well, <clears throat> agriculture is, is a huge uh, part of our state. In uh, the city of Des Moines, uh, we have a number of value-added uh, uh, businesses uh, for agricultural products. And uh, I think that, that uh, in an awful lot of our population, uh, you know, either the, themselves or their progenitors all came off of the farms. And so I happen to be, you know, one of those. And uh, it... There, so there's a relationship between the urban and the rural. And sometimes uh, uh, for... We, we as mayors operate sort of in a non-political way. I mean, I, I, I have to work with Democrats and Republicans and no parties and, and a variety of other folks uh, out there. And 
you know, a pothole is neither a, 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 red, a red pothole or a blue pothole. <laughs> so we have to figure out how to deal with every single person every single day. And unfortunately, sometimes, uh, you know, there are those that, that really are all political that start pitting one group against another. And, and so they'll say, you know, rural against urban. And, uh, but really, those of us here in Iowa, uh, we, we recognize each other's importance and what we bring to the table and how we work together. And like and, you said, you're so interconnected, right? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, um, you know, I got to tell you, is we work on water issues, we work on all kinds of other issues. I got to tell you, everybody, rural, uh, suburban, urban, we all care about clean water. We all care about the, the future of agriculture and where food comes from and, and what the prospects are of doing that for future generations. And I think that we all are invested in that and we all need to work together and uh, uh, we need to overcome some of the divide that uh, sometimes political structure um, um, puts in front of us. And uh, I think that uh, mayors and local government are probably a key areas that we can make that happen because, like I say, we, uh, we deal with all parties every day, 24 hours a day. Mayor Pete, I was wondering, um, what role have the, has the presence of major research universities um, like Notre Dame, just, just north of South Bend, what role has that played in, in your city's success? Oh, it's crucial. I mean, uh, I would argue that if, if a mayor has a magic wand and can put one thing in her city, it could be an NFL team, a waterfall, uh, you should pick a major research university um, because the uh, intellectual uh, uh, property that comes out of that, the, the energy, the activity. But it only works if you recognize that uh, a university is not like uh, any other entity. So you have to understand it's not the same as if you have a military base or, or, or a hospital or a major corporation. Uh, now it's more complicated for us because we're actually an industrial city. We built up not around Notre Dame but around Studebaker and have spent the last 50 years how to, figuring out uh, how not to be the company town that lost its company. Notre Dame's not even in the city limits of South Bend and yet it's obviously a major employer but crucially it's also a source of people not just at the faculty level but even the undergraduate level whose intellects we can put to work on civic issues. Issues. Such a great resource. Right? Absolutely. And if we get it right, it's not just a resource for us, but it's a resource for them. So to me, the test of a great college town is, is the, the town better off that your big institutional player is a college and not some other large player? But is the university better off because it's in South Bend and not some other place? And I think College Town 2.0 is about understanding your, your university residents, not just as warm bodies, not just uh, based on you know, how, they, uh, how much they can spend in your coffee shops or what they do to your housing market or whether you got to bust their parties. I mean, there you're just dealing with them as <laughs> residents. What interests me is, uh, you know, if, uh, for example, we have a, a project called the Bowman Creek Educational Ecosystem. It's the most, uh, one of the most economically challenged square miles in our city. Um, a city, by the way, which you might not realize being in Notre Dame's backyard, still has per capita income below $20,000 overall. So we've got some serious economic challenges. We also have an environmental challenge around this underground river. Uh, now, in the process of remediating it, we're engaging students from the civil engineering department, as well as uh, anthropologists who are studying what's going on in the neighborhood and crucially working with uh, the, the neighbors in something that is being done with them, not to them. And I believe that will not only make the neighborhood better off, but when these young students, engineering students, for example, are interviewing for jobs, and they know how to engage a tough customer at a neighborhood meeting, how much more convincing are they as somebody you might be wanting to put in front of a client? So we're better off, but they're better off too. Exciting. Mayor Carter, what do mayors like you do to encourage these innovative um, technology companies to, to come to your cities and, and to compete in the heartland? What is your message for the the Googles, the Apples, the, the Amazons, who tend to, you know, locate their headquarters on one coast or the other. And though, though we know, you know, with, with uh, Amazon, they're looking at cities like Columbus for the next head, the second headquarters. Sure. We're, well, like I said okay. earlier, for folks who are interested in water, we've got lots of water between our river and our lakes. <laughs> uh, and we like to show, you know, when, when people look at St. Paul, they see opportunity. Uh, and so I think some of us in, I, I, I think Mayor Pete put it well, you know, and sometimes I think Midwestern cities, we have to work harder to get their attention. But when they look, they see opportunity. In St. Paul, like you mentioned, we have 
uh, a number of large Fortune 500 companies, uh, 3M, uh, Ecolab, CHS, Securian Financial, our newest Fortune 500 company. Uh, and those create a great environment, not only for job seekers, uh, but also for that kind of innovation culture, uh, like the 30 uh, tech innovators who are part in, in St. Paul right now as part of a program called Techstars, uh, preparing their businesses for exits. Uh, like the 65, I believe, uh, companies that are preparing to participate in our uh, million dollar business plan pitch contest uh, that we're gonna have next month uh, for businesses owned by people of color. We have an incredible uh, uh, con concentration of people, of innovation, of ideas uh, happening right there in St. Paul uh, that we're really excited to talk about. One of the Midwestern values is when we're really excited about something, we make sure not to tell anyone. <laughs> But we're breaking that rule and we're telling them about all those opportunities. We're telling them. But one of the biggest things I think that creates an opportunity for us, all of those companies you mentioned have to be able to compete worldwide. They have to be able to compete globally. So one of the ways we are, I think, switching our lens on how we look at our own city is we're an incredibly diverse city. We're almost half people of color right now. And children in our public schools speak over 100 different languages at home. We forever have looked at that as a challenge for us. You know, it's hard to close the gaps. It's hard to teach children English as a second language. We're switching our lens on that and saying, wait a minute, this kind of diversity, this kind of multilingualism uh, is, our, is the key to our, the door, to opening that door to a uh, global, the type of global economy that ought to exist in a place like St. Paul. Are they listening, those they companies? Are. They are. <laughs> they are. Mayor County, I want to go to you to, to talk about the, the economy and uh, with in Iowa, the, the unemployment being so, so low. I mean, we're, we're hearing that there are sometimes more jobs uh, than you have workers for. Uh, you know, you, this, that this full unemployment can be sometimes actually a bit of a challenge. Who benefits when, when this happens? Is it is it the big corporations? Is it small businesses? Or are you seeing it lift up the, the average Iowan who, who wants to join the middle class? Uh, good question, but it, 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 it's a bit of a challenge at the moment, you know, with the low unemployment and, uh, for instance, Des Moines is the third largest insurance center in the world. So it, it's, you know, we've got people that, that need to uh, be highly educated, need to be prepared to uh, take on careers in some of these kinds of uh, insurance, financial processing, everything else. Uh, and uh, so we are somewhat challenged and we're seeing, I think in part, that's uh, one of the drivers of, of the increase in population that's, that's going on in the city of Des Moines and, and uh, probably in South Bend and, and in St. Paul as well, that people from other areas around the country are looking for opportunities to come to Des Moines. Uh, but I do believe that overall it's, it's beginning to, to lift up, but we still have to, um, we're challenged uh, in the city of Des Moines with uh, an awful lot of uh, the diversity that uh, some of the other cities are, are facing. I mean, we've, we've got um, over 100 different languages spoken in our, our, our schools. And so you have to prepare those young people for careers and a life in, in and around uh, the city of Des Moines. And uh, while it's a bit of a challenge, we also celebrate it. It's, a, it's an opportunity. This is, uh, Des Moines is like a melting pot uh, you know, um, of, of the world right here. I mean, we've got one high school where there is no uh, uh, population that exceeds like 25%. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's amazing to watch, uh, you know, the Asian population, the African population, the, uh, uh, the Latinos. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, people from all over the world are finding Iowa in the Midwest a great place to, to come. Uh, and quickly to, to look at some of our uh, assets, uh, Iowa has water too, sometimes too much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but it, it, the, at the same time, uh, we're attracting some of those high tech companies. I mean, we have seen recently, and again, this is a challenge for more highly trained people, but we've seen Facebook, we've seen uh, uh, Microsoft, we've seen Apple locate multi-billion dollar operations in and around the Metro Des Moines area. And uh, part of it has to do, in addition to everything else, that uh, they're not on the coasts, 
that uh, they're, they're not challenged with uh, hurricanes and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, the cost of water is inexpensive, and the cost of power is inexpensive, and I will um, generally don't, you know, tout uh, what's going on, but Amer MidAmerican Energy, eight, ten years ago, was 2% renewable uh, energy. Today, they're 50.8% and they uh, renewable and they have pledged to uh, essentially go 100% renewable by 2020. That's unbelievable and it guarantees costs of, of those utilities that help run some of these businesses and they being at the moment about the uh, low, I think their ninth, eighth or ninth lowest cost of utilities uh, in, in the country. So it's very impressive, uh, very attractive, obviously. Mayor Pete, we're, we're going to go to questions shortly. I want to just ask a very quick political question. There were people who wondered when you ran for mayor why you weren't running for Congress recently. So the thing about Congress, okay. <laughs> oh. with all respect for the people who are there, um, is that when, when you're a mayor, you're, you're doing things. I'm shaping, helping to shape the city that I grew up in. I know there's this, this old model where it's sort of the, it's like, it's like going from the minor leagues to the major leagues and everybody assumed that uh, the federal level is the most kind of desirable level. And I just, uh, I mean, not true. You've seen Congress. <laughs> so, you know, I think at the local level, you have this opportunity. And I think local leadership is a big part of the answer to how the Midwest has been able to produce a lot of great things in the last decade. So you're going to stay as a mayor? Well, no, no plans. To... I'm not going to make any news oh, okay. today, right. uh, other than to Please. say that uh, you, you know I think it's it's so compelling to see what can be done at the local level, and I'm glad we're living in this moment when people have a higher regard uh, for what's happening in our cities and what's happening in our towns. And I really hope that our state and federal leaders will realize that a big part of how they can do their job best is to allow us to do our job more freely. And Mark Carter. <laughs> <laughs> But before we go to the audience for questions, I'd like you to just do a quick myth bust for us. What is one myth about the heartland that you would like to bust right here? That's interesting. You know, I was telling a group of folks out in D.C. last week that whatever you think about St. Paul, uh, it's probably different than what uh, what you expect. You know, as I hear the mayors talk about the challenges that they face, but also the opportunities that we all have as a community uh, between the international community, between the multilingualism, uh, between all the innovation that happens here. You know, I think there's an I think there's an enormous amount of opportunities. I don't know that uh, what I see. I, I think the biggest myth I hear is people act like it's real cold in the Midwest and. I, uh, and it's not. And it's yeah, <laughs> it's it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> But I think what, what, so, what we encounter is people who just haven't taken a look at Minnesota, haven't taken a look at the heartland uh, to see what opportunities are there. And like I said, when they do take a look uh, and they bring their coats and their hats and their scarves. And their uh, gloves. And, their, and gloves, their boots. And their boots. And they find out that there's nothing but incredible opportunity. Exciting. All right, let's go to the audience because I know you have questions. All right. Here's the microphone and here's the lady right here with, all oh, right, gentlemen there with the question. Uh, Eric Eidehan, Wolf of Wells Fargo as Community Development Officer. Uh, my question is regarding immigrants. Um, to the mayors, uh, some are uh, about 50% in terms of population of immigrants. Uh, one thing I know, having lived in Des Moines for almost 20 years, is that uh, the younger generations, they leave after college to bigger cities. And then when they start raising families, they move back to Des Moines. However, among the immigrant community, when they leave, they don't come back. So how were you able to retain your numbers to make it that diverse? The man from Minnesota. Well, I appreciate the question, and I think it's a really important question because one of the things that I think we can do a lot better, particularly in St. Paul, is say, how do we uh, not just sort of include the immigrants and refugees who are in our city? How do we not just include them in our schools and include them in our neighborhoods and include them in our workforce, but how do we allow them to really touch our community and be a part of building the, not just we're including you in ours, but we are making ours together. And that's, I think, that's something that's, that, that's absolutely critical uh, right now, especially people in our immigrant and refugee communities feel threatened. 
And so we have to work with them to make sure that they know uh, that, they are, that we see them as part of our community and that there's no separating that. Uh, there's no separating our, 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 our local families. Uh, and, but that also means saying, how do we go even beyond that? And so, you know, right now in St. Paul, you know, we're, one of the things that we're doing right now is focusing on what we call our cultural districts. Uh, and to say we have cultural districts where we have uh, concentrations of African-owned businesses, of, of, of Latino-owned businesses, of Asian-owned businesses, of African-American-owned businesses. And we're going to invest in those places because they're, they're places where people are working incredibly hard. They're doing incredible things. They're building their businesses and they're providing jobs. We can create jobs. We can create infrastructure. We can create economic opportunities in the neighborhoods that we need the most by switching that lens I was talking earlier, uh, talking about earlier and seeing that diversity, that multilingualism as one of our greatest assets. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, and I believe we have a question right here. Hi, Deborah Salowitz, Strategic Relocation Solutions. Um, this may require a little bit of a crystal ball, but maybe not, considering how much compelling scientific evidence is out there now that what the Midwest is being called often is the Goldilocks zone for climate change. And we're going to start seeing population relocation to the center of the country as a response to what's happening on the coasts, particularly on the East Coast and the Southeast Coast. And is there, have you started looking at a longer term plan, whether it's a new iteration of the Tomorrow Plan or whatever, to anticipate and respond to and be proactive about the influx of people coming, basically migrating within the continental United States to the center of the country? What a great question. Yeah, and a very, very timely question. I think in a community like mine that experienced population loss uh, after the industrial collapse of the 60s, we actually have so much infrastructure that it would, nothing would be better for us than to accelerate population growth. In other communities, it's a major challenge. And for any community, it's a challenge to figure out. But it's amazing to me how many places have an economic growth strategy and do not have a population growth strategy. Uh, part of the answer to that is immigration. Matter of fact, uh, if you do it on a net basis, 100% of our population growth in South Bend would be attributable to immigration. Uh, but I think thinking about the, the impact of climate, and we may not see it in a way that's obvious. So we might think what we're seeing is people moving because of cost reasons. Uh, but actually, if you peel back the onion a little bit, you realize that climate is one of the drivers of what's happening uh, in terms of uh, the availability of affordable places to be uh, in some of our coastal cities. That being being said, uh, you know, we're also on the business end of climate change. In South Bend, we had a uh, thousand year rainfall. And 18 months later, we had what they told me was a, either a 500 or a 2500 year river flood, depending how you count it. Uh, so either I'm running ridiculous odds right now in terms of what can happen in one mayor's tenure, or uh, things are changing. And things are changing in a way that we've got to cope with as well. And uh, there is just not a national strategy. Um, or even a regional strategy on climate security. Uh, we're still debating 20th century kinds of security, like border security, which still exists and is still a concern. But when it comes to election security, when it comes to cyber security, and certainly when it comes to climate security, uh, we are at least a decade behind. Right. Mayor County. Let me just throw a couple things. For those of us that, that were in Iowa and remember June 30, we had events almost like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we are trying to do in the city of Des Moines, uh, in, in, in addition to everything else and in our planning and, and as we look at, at our uh, regional uh, tomorrow plan, uh, looking at the future, we're not only looking at, at what infrastructure we have to put in place to handle s some of these events. I can't imagine what the infrastructure would look like to handle 10 inches of rain in three hours. Uh, but it, it's, we're thinking about it. But we're also looking at where we build. I mean, we're looking at the topography of this city, and if we are going to grow, and we are, where should we grow, and how should we grow, and how should we build resiliently, how should we build sustainably so that we can uh, survive uh, circumstances that are beginning to present themselves on a very regular basis that looks like 500-year, 1,000-year, 1,500-year events that all of a sudden are popping up every three, four years. And uh, um, we've got a plan for it. We have to look uh, very hard in all of our departments on how we structure our city to protect our citizens. Okay. Another question. Let's see, right here. Great. Right here. 
Hi there, I'm Gina skinner Thebo with the Atwood Center for Women. I was just curious, especially with Des Moines, um, the One Economy report really shows the disparity. I know we're prosperous, um, especially for people that look like me, but what are we doing to deliberately address that gap, especially when it comes to, I mean, for people of color, especially black people? Well, uh, we, we have looked at it uh, real hard. So our, our Civil Human Rights Commission and, and Joshua Barr specifically uh, uh, in Des Moines, we are trying to figure out how we reach out to uh, all people, regardless of age, regardless of gender. How do we connect them with opportunity? How do we connect them to services, especially some of the immigrant population? And uh, uh, it, it, it sometimes is hard because for a lot of reasons, sometimes they don't speak the language or they don't trust. Uh, we have to be as open as possible and provide as many opportunities uh, to give people uh, advice, guidance, uh, connect them to uh, a lot of the, the resources that are in and around Des Moines uh, that, that can help them and give them a boost up and a lift up. Uh, and uh, also trying to work with employers uh, to let us know what those job opportunities are and what levels of training people need and then connect those people to the training to get them connected to the kinds of jobs that uh, hopefully will uh, boost them up and, and give them uh, uh, an income that uh, will sustain uh, will sustain life in in uh, in a comfortable sort of a way. Thank you all for your questions. I'm afraid we're out of time, so please join me in thanking my wonderful panel of mayors, Mayor County, Mayor Pete, Mayor Carter. Thank okay. you.